Hi there, and welcome back to Conversations with Father Greg. Today we have a homily for Sunday, February 12th, 2023. It's the third and final installment in a study on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew's Gospel. Before we get to the homily, let's turn our attention to today's reading from Matthew. Matthew writes, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not bear false witness, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, Do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The Gospel of Christ Dear God, may only your truth be spoken and only your truth be heard. Amen. Well, hi there, everyone. Have you ever been ghosted? I have. For those who don't know, Ghosting someone is defined as when one person intentionally cuts off all communication with another person without warning or notice. It includes avoiding phone calls, social media, and even avoiding them in public. Ghosting occurs when one person perceives a slight or injustice from another and decides to terminate the relationship rather than working together to fix the problem. We sometimes see this in social relationships, it occasionally occurs in romantic relationships, and we definitely see it in churches. And it's one of the things that we'll be thinking about in today's homily. You may recall that last week we read about Jesus telling his disciples that he had not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. He then begins to redefine what obedience to the law actually meant. Our Gospel reading for today picks up where we left off last week. Jesus starts off with an examination of the commandment against murder. Thou shalt not commit murder. Let's face it, although we might joke around about it from time to time, I think most of us find it pretty easy to follow this one. I doubt many of us today have killed very many people. But look at what Jesus does with this commandment. Jesus told his disciples, 
I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. If you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. If you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. We begin to see a couple of things here. Jesus was right in his claim that he wasn't abolishing the law. In fact, he was interpreting it even more strictly. As the commandment was originally given, it only really concerned how we treated another person's physical body. Don't kill was a literal prohibition against grievous bodily harm. But Jesus' approach broadened the scope and considered the whole person and not just the physical aspect. Jesus was saying that murder wasn't simply a physical act, but rather that murder could be an emotional and psychological thing. In the next few verses, we see him beginning to treat some of the other commandments the same way. He acknowledged the physical aspect, but said the physical was only the beginning of the law and not its end. He began talking about what people were doing with their hearts and minds, not simply with their bodies. We begin to see that intentions are important as what we put into action. Suppose, just for a moment, we take Jesus' expansive view of the human person and apply that definition to our daily lives. What if we considered that there is more to a person than their physical body? How does this affect the way that we treat each other? How do we manage our anger or our hurt? Do we stop and consider the other person's feelings before we speak? How does the other person's history inform their behavior? Suppose this teaching isn't just about how we speak to another person. What if it also includes how we speak about other people? Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines character assassination as the slandering of a person, usually with the intention of destroying public confidence in that person. Do we speak about others in ways that damage their reputation or character? Do we tear others down or do we build them up? At the very least, this text calls us to examine our intentions before we speak to or about another person. Do our words bring health and life to the whole person or do they hurt and destroy? There is a second thing that I would like us to consider in this text. Jesus also taught his disciples the following. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Did you hear that? He told them that if they remembered that their brother or sister has something against them, they should go and make it right. Think about that for a moment. Jesus wasn't talking about whether they had something against someone else. He said that if someone had something against them, they had an obligation to go and work it out. It's not enough to work out the problems that you or I have with another person. Jesus is saying that if we are aware that another person has an issue with us, then we have a responsibility to work it out. One person does not own any break or fracture in a relationship. It's owned by both people. Both people need to work together to restore the relationship. This provides another example of Jesus raising the bar and setting a priority on conflict resolution and healthy relationships. By this standard, determining who is right and who is wrong is a whole lot less important than resolving the conflict. Identifying blame is far less important than resolving the issue and restoring health to the relationship. When I was a boy, my brother and I often got into fights over one thing or another. Inevitably, one of us would run to my parents and say, he started it. I can still hear my dad's voice saying, I don't care who started it. Make it stop. This is a little like what we read in today's text. 
Who started the problem in a relationship is far less important than getting the problem resolved. So what does this all mean for you and I today? Where's the practical application? At first, this text challenges us to see people for who they truly are. We are more than simply a physical body. Most of us have been on this journey through life for decades. Along the way, we have celebrated successes and we have nursed wounds. Each of us has a history that affects who we are, how we see the world, and how we respond to other people. For better or worse, our words can affect each other on an emotional and psychological level. As people of faith, we are encouraged to look at each other, striving to see the whole person and consider what may be going on beneath the surface. Our text today challenges us to allow our words and actions to be informed by a deeper understanding of who other people truly are. The second thing that we get from this text is the importance of reconciliation, not only with God, but also with other people. Let's face it, relationships can be a source of strength and comfort, but they can also be hard work. Sometimes others say things that hurt us deeply, and if we're honest, we have to admit that we make mistakes too, lashing out in pain, anger, or frustration, and sometimes we hurt those who are close to us. Maintaining good, healthy relationships requires the hard work of honesty, vulnerability, and a commitment to communication, even when the going gets rough. Last week, we heard Jesus calling his disciples to be salt and light in the world. As people of faith, we are called to be different from the world around us. Relationships can become just as bruised, battered, and broken as people can. The question is whether we are committed to repairing our broken relationships, or do we discard them and the people that go along with those relationships? Our text from today encourages us to always seek reconciliation and wholeness, independent of who started it. Let's pray. Dear God, Lord of our hearts, you see us, you know us, you love and protect us. We pray that you will bless our relationships and lift us up in service to you as Christians and as the people you want us to be. Amen. Amen.